to help us understand the chi-squared test of proportions, we're going to start out with a two proportions heat test, and we're going to make, uh, make some comparisons. So let's suppose we were doing an experiment, uh, testing a new drug versus a placebo on something, I don't know, maybe patients suffering from narcolepsy or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so let's suppose the null says that the proportion of people that stay awake uh, with the drug is equal to the proportion of uh, narcoleptics who stay awake with the placebo and be a two-tailed alternative. If you recall, this is the test that we had to pool the p-hats. We had to add the two uh, sample successes together and divide by the uh, some of the two samples because we were trying to estimate what this same proportion would be. So we ran the test, and let's look at it in a two-way table to help us with the chi-squared. Uh, All together we had a sample of 40 and a sample of 60, and this would be like the x sub 1 and the x sub 2, the number of successes, and this would be n sub 1 plus n sub 2. So when we pulled the p-hats, we got a total of 75 people out of 100 who would be uh, staying awake with, with either drug. So if we assume the null is true, then the differences are just due to random chance and we would expect 75% uh, of the people to stay awake. So we would use a pool P hat of 75 in the, uh, in the problem. Now as we proceeded with the problem, we'd say, oh, our test statistic then would be, well, uh, people with the drug, that was a 35 out of 40, that's a P hat, a P1 hat of 0.875 minus the, uh, this proportion, 40 out of 60, would be 0.667, and we divided by that wonderful standard deviation formula and used the 0.75, the pooled p hat down there. We would end up with a z-score of 2.357 and a p-value of 0.0184. So we would reject the null. The evidence would set, suggest that there is a difference in the proportion of narcoleptics who are staying awake. Okay, now we want to go to a chi-squared test. I'm going to remind us of what the results were for the two proportion Z test, but here we go. Chi-squared test proportion, same null, same alternative. To find expected counts in each cell, we're supposed to take the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. So we can kind of see this is the formula right here. Well, let's see what that means. If we take the row total of 40 times the column total of 75, and divide it by the grand total of 100, then we're taking 40 times 75 divided by 100. Now, if you really say, oh, by the way, so 40 times 75 uh, times 100, that would give us an expected count of 30 in this cell. But let's think about what that means. What we're saying is if the null is true, then we're assuming that the proportions are equal, the proportion of people able to stay awake is equal, it doesn't matter whether we're on the drug or the placebo. And furthermore, we would attribute the differences in our results just due to random chance. But overall, we'd be expecting that 75 out of 100 of all the patients, regardless of the drug, would be able to stay awake. So, what I want us to see is that this formula makes all the sense in the world. If you take the column total divided by the grand total, this is the pooled p hat. We're expecting the null is true and that overall it's going to be 75 out of 100 people are staying awake regardless of whether you're in the drug or the placebo treatment group. So what we do is we take the row total and what is that saying? Hey, there were 40 people that were on the drug. Out of those 40 people, we expect 75% to stay awake. So 40 times the column total over the grand total, that gives us 30 out of 40 people staying awake. When we get to the placebo group, we're still expecting, now this is a sample of 60, so we're expecting of those 60 people, if the null is true, we're also expecting 75 one hundredths of them, 75% of them to also uh, be staying awake. So this is an expected count of 45. And we do the same thing here. We do row total times column total. So we get our expected counts of 15 here and of 10 here. So we have our expected counts, our observed counts, so by golly. Then we go to what we've always done, for the kind squared, we take the observed count minus the expected count squared over the expected count plus this. We do that for each cell. Now our degrees of freedom is going to be rows minus one times columns minus one. So two rows minus one is one. Two columns minus one is one. So degrees of freedom, we have one degree of freedom. Now we can show all this work right here, but we can use the calculator to help us to do uh, whoops, no, sorry. We can use the calculator to help us to do this problem. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the matrix. We're going to type, um, 
these, I'm going to get a mistake here in a sec, the, uh, another note, smart note thing is coming up. But we go to the matrix, and we're going to go into the edit version of the matrix, and we're going to create a matrix that matches the dimensions of this guy. We need a two by two matrix. So we're going in here, and we're going to create a matrix that is two by two, and we're going to put in the observed counts in the matrix. So we're going to put 35, we're going to put 5, we're going to put 40, and we're going to put 20 into the cells of our matrix. And then the nice thing about these calculators is we'll go run the test with that matrix as our observed matrix. So we're going to go stat, we're going to go over to tests, we're going to scroll up. This time we're going to chi-squared test, not the goodness of fit test. So we're going here, and all the calculator needs is, hey, did you put your observed counts in there? It's going to reconfigure matrix B and put all the expected counts in that, and it's going to calculate everything for us, so we'll have a p-value in addition to a test statistic. Now what I want to see is that what we got was a chi-squared value of 5.555, and a p-value of 0 0.014 for this test. So again, because the probability of type 1 error is less than 5%, we reject the null. The evidence suggests the alternative is true and that the two proportions are different. But hold the phone. Look at that. We got the exact same p-value with the chi-squared test of proportions as we did with the two-proportion z-test. Wait a minute. But these are different. This chi-squared statistic is different from that z-score. But you know what? I wonder what would happen if we squared that z-score. <laughs> Maybe you guessed it. If you square that z-score, you get 5.555. Because this two-way table that we're using for the chi-squared test of proportions is utilizing the same information, including a pooled p-hat, to run the test and analyze it. In fact, if you think about this two-proportion z-test, and how the average difference is zero, you get some negative values and some positive values. Well, chi-squared can only run a two-tailed test, but think about this, you guys. Because we have some, like here, a negative value, but it gets squared, there's no negative values possible. So what chi-squared does, it's kind of cool, is it takes all these negative values that you could get for z-scores, squares them so that they become bigger, and this half of the distribution, all the z-scores also get squared, so you end up with a chi-squared distribution that's skewed to the right. And the critical chi-squared value that traps 5% is just like the z-score of 1.645 squared. And so anyways, this is the relationship between a chi-squared distribution and a, and a normal distribution, is that if you have one degree of freedom, and it's only in that case, the chi-squared uh, distribution is really the normal distribution squared. So there's a relationship there. Now, if we continue, the nice thing about a chi-squared test of proportions is we're not limited to testing two proportions at a time. We can test multiple. So let's suppose we're going to see if we can keep the narcoleptics awake by either giving them the new drug or a placebo or coffee or a lighthouse. I tried. A lighthouse tries to stay awake. <laughs> the boat, like, stay awake. I think it works. Okay, if it doesn't, then check this out. It's a night light, okay? Nobody can sleep with a night light. So, yeah, my point exactly. So, anyways, there it is. Four different treatment groups. Now, the null on a chi squared test is going to be that all the proportions are equal, that there's no difference. And then again, remember, the expected counts are the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. So, what we're saying is that all together, in, in all these samples, we ended up with 113 people out of 148 who were able to stay awake. Well, that's like a pooled P hat. All together, 113 out of 148 stayed awake. So that is about 0.635. That's 76% of the people are staying awake. So that's the pooled P hat. If the null is true and all the proportions are equal, then we assume for any sample we're going to get about that proportion of people staying awake. Doesn't matter what treatment group they're in. And we would only attribute the differences to just being due to random chance. So, what does this have to do with anything? We say, well, you know what? 113 out of 148, that's the column total divided by the grand total. That's the pooled P hat, the pooled success rate. So, in this sample of 40 in this treatment group, we're expecting this portion of people 
to be staying awake and the other to be falling asleep. So how do we find the expected counts in this cell? We take out of those 40 people, we're expecting 113, 148 of them to stay awake. Multiply together, that goes in that cell as the expected count. In the placebo group, we had 60 people, but again, we're expecting that 113, 148 of them are also going to be able to stay awake because we assume the null is true. Uh, so anyways, that's how we find the expected counts. In this cell, we're expecting 35, 148 not to stay awake. So we take these 40 people times 35, the column total divided by the grand total, to not stay awake. Now we can show the work in a few cells of how we would find the expected count, but once again, we'd go to the handy dandy calculator and we'd go back to the matrix, second matrix, this time we're dealing with a matrix that's a four by two, four rows and two columns. So we're going to go over to the edit. We've got to edit this up. We're going to make it a four by two, so four by two. And we're going to put in all of our observed counts, the 35, the 5, uh, the 40, the 20, keep going, come on, baby. the 40, the, okay, the 20, come on now. Uh, not have already batteries, that's for sure. There's no rabbit here. Okay, so then we got 21 and we got 8. 17, and we have 2. So all of our expected counts went into this matrix, and then, voila, we go back to stat, we go over to test. Again, we go up to the chi-squared test. Everything's where we want. We have the observed counts in A. We don't even have to reconfigure matrix B. We go to calculate, and there it is. It gives us our chi-squared statistic and our p-value. We're below 0.05, so with the probability of a type 1 error of less than 5%, the evidence suggests that not all of these proportions are equal. And if we wanted to find out which ones are officially different, then we can match them up two at a time. Uh, last idea then is right here. For the test of proportions, here's our write-up. We say we're doing a chi-squared test of proportions. We have the null and the alternative. We have the conditions that the data either came from a random sample or a census. We have data for a whole population. All the expected counts need to be at least one, and at most 20% of the expected counts, less than five. We show our work with the test statistic. Don't forget degrees of freedom. And this is how we find expected value. And then lastly, the conclusion, hey, because the probability of a type one error is either greater than 0.05 or less than 0.05, we either reject the null or fail to reject the null. One last thing, to address the assumption, we want to make sure that all these expected counts we get by multiplying this here are all at least one and at most 20% or less than five. Hey, we can write this down, but then let's be sneaky. We don't even have to calculate each one of those. We can go back to the calculator because what it did was it went back into matrix, oh please, no, no, yes, okay. It went back into matrix B and boom. There are all of the expected counts. So we can show the work by hand, but go to matrix B. There is one expected count, 4.49 for that cell. So we have one cell out of eight with a count less than five, but we're okay with our assumptions, with our conditions, because one cell out of eight is less than 20%. It's only 12.5% of our cells have expected counts less than five. So we met the conditions and life is good. So good luck with the test of proportions.